it's, a, it's a pleasure to be able to do this tonight. I know it's a busy time of the year as everyone's turning in papers, finals, and theses, um, but this is just a, a, a wonderful opportunity. I'm thrilled to be here uh, with the author, film director, actress, activist, uh, Amber Tamblin, uh, who has spent the afternoon here at Princeton University. Some of you might know her from TV and film. She's worked on shows uh, including uh, Joan of Arcadia, House, Two and a Half Men, uh, films such as The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, The Grudge II, The Ring, 127 Hours. Um, she has also, uh, we're going to talk about uh, her work on, I said at the dinner, multiple platforms. There's very uh, few people who can work across different media, including filmmaking. Uh, some of you might have seen her film, and you can see it on uh, Netflix, Paint It Black. And she is a, an author of uh, three books of poetry, a novel that came out last year uh, called Any Man, and now she has another book that we're going to discuss uh, tonight called The Era of Ignition, Coming of Age in the Time of Rage and Revolution, which we're selling outside afterwards, and uh, she'll be able to sign them for you. And as I have been saying, this is a really powerful book about her own evolution uh, and activism in the last few years, including founding Time's Up, co-founding Time's Up, uh, which is an organization that's doing amazing work uh, on, on sexual harassment issues that have come to the forefront of our attention. And uh, it's an important moment to be having these conversations. Uh, the last two years, uh, last three years, are just a phase, but an important phase in the evolution of the feminist movement and feminist politics, which have emerged in different incarnations and tackled different issues over the decades. So uh, it's, it's really wonderful to have Amber here at Princeton to spend some time with us. So thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Hi, you guys. Thanks for coming out. So. <laughs> Maybe we can start uh, just with the question of, you just had a book out uh, of fiction last summer. How did you decide to write Era of Ignition and, and what was your motivation for uh, spending some time on this project? Um, so I had been thinking about, I think with some of my writing and my work that I've done as a, um, a opinion writer for the New York Times, uh, in the last couple of years, I've been trying to find a way to describe and explain uh, what it is, this moment that we're in right now, that um, uh, with the Me Too movement and with Time's Up and you know, with an unprecedented number of women being elected uh, to office and an unprecedented number of women running for the President of the United States, um, what is this sort of time of real condensed change uh, that is also met with a an unmatched and sort of never before seen or not seen in a long time rage and anger um, that is propelling us into this national conversation and the change that's that's taking place. And so I, I was thinking about I think the image the fi the image of fire always comes to mind, but also this idea of feeling ignited um, in our own personal resolutions and our own um, and our own trajectory. And so the term era of ignition came to me as a term to describe where we are right now, each and every one of us. Um, whether, whether we are you know, feeling like we are part of that move, movement or whether we are feeling isolated from that movement, um, from the civil rights movement that is actually happening right now in this country, um, and, and really you know, facing a, a national existential crisis and what we're all doing to make things better, or sometimes worse, depending. And the book, early in the book, you talk about making the film Paint It Black, and that's part of uh, the story that you're telling connected to the politics. Yeah. Tell us about, about the film and why that was important for this story. So Paint It Black um, is, a, is a film that I co-wrote and directed, uh, which is an adaptation of the Janet Fitch novel, and um, I think I shot it in like 2014. Um, and for me, and you know, I grew up as an actress, I grew up, I'm 35 now, and... Um, 
which by the way, for in like the interviews I've done for this book, I was telling everybody I'm 34, that I'm turning 35 this year, until my publicist finally corrected me after like four months of it. And I was like, oh my God, I've lost an entire year. <laughs> and I don't, know if that, I don't know if I can blame that on the president or my two-year-old. Like, I don't know which one. Anyway, um, so for me, uh, I, I wanted to write and, and direct this movie because I wanted, I wanted to know what it felt like to have ownership over my own creative visions. And as an actress growing up in the industry that I did, um, I only really ever knew how to kind of go into other people's rooms and interpret their art. So I was only ever speaking their language, their dialogue. Um, you know, bringing to life the characters that they were creating, which is in and of itself an important art and an important thing that you can bring to the table. But for me, I knew I had so much more to offer. And making the movie was such a, a, a powerful moment for me because it, it allowed me to see through something that I really believed in that had something to say that was wholly in my voice and that was wholly in my control and that I got to dictate the outcome and the tone of that film. And, and what it did is it sort of made me so aware of my capacity and my potential to be able to do those things for myself and for my own creative life going forward. I couldn't really unknow what I knew about myself at that time. And, um, and so whether or not the movie succeeded or failed, whether it was loved or hated, um, whether it was seen or not seen, didn't matter anymore because for me the success was already just in the creation of it, in being able to do that, in being able to harness that creative energy for myself and, and to, to be able to make something, again, wholly original and that belonged to me in a certain space. It was very difficult getting the film made. It had a lot of roadblocks. Um, I write extensively about it in the book and about the experience of being a female filmmaker, what that's like. Um, in a business that is predominantly run by um, men across the board in, in pretty much every position of power. And I'm, I'm thinking as, if, as you speak, one of the themes of the book is, is or it's a, a theme in the book, is the way in which language, the way in which cultural relations, all of this plays a big role in, in how power uh, is exerted. Uh, does your uh, growing up as an actress and playing roles all the time and understanding that people play roles and given roles. Did that affect the way you see uh, these issues? I, I, think it, I think it did to a degree. If anything, what it did is it really, you know, be, the, the act of acting, that experience in and of itself is such an em empathic journey and so much of it has to do with being able to put yourself in other people's shoes and feel what they feel and convey their emotions, whether those emotions are love or hate or you know sadness, loss, grief, whatever those things are. And so I think that so much of my um, writing capacity and my um, and certainly my my empathy for our nation, which I feel is very much existentially lost in a certain way is trying to find itself um, and so much of the of what we are feeling the uncertainty and the sense that you know the foundation has been ripped up underneath us and things are cha changing at a very rapid pace that we cannot control I make an argument in the book that we need to lean into these things that they're very good that the change is good the chaos is good and that we shouldn't be afraid of that um, we shouldn't be afraid of of the discomfort of that so I think that my, a lot of my acting and my ability to access those empathic roots in myself um, are, have so much to do with how I have become the activist and the person that I am today, which was always there for me since I was a kid. Um, uh, but I think even more so now, seeing, seeing the way that people are feeling about the current state of our country, I identify with it deeply, and it's rooted in me in the in the the trade of that experience and in the understanding of how they're feeling and for for the interpretation of that and saying what can each of us bring to the table to make things better to um, to work as hard as we can not to just be scared but to be actively engaged proactively engaged um, 
in the change and in what we really want to see for this country. And then you got involved in the 2008 campaign, and yes. you, already ha you already knew Hillary Clinton before the campaign. And yeah, I knew her a little bit um, through the actress Mary Steenburgen, who played my mom on Joan of Arcadia, and I had the pleasure of seeing her speak so many times, and um, I, I co-ran her youth outreach program in 2008 for her 2008 campaign with uh, the actress America Ferreira, who's my bestie, um, and we went to, I think, like 30 states... Yeah, probably about 30 states in, in that year uh, campaigning for her, and then again in 2016 as well. So I really got to see, um, in a very intimate way, um, you know, I think a lot of the systemic uh, sexist and misogynistic issues that we have as a country and not being able to define um, the parameters under which women are allowed to be powerful and, and the ways in which we... Uh, mythologize and create stories about women who are in positions of power as a way to uh, demean them and, and sort of separate them and, and sort of bring them down a, a peg. And you collected during the campaign, we talked about this earlier, but you collected uh, newspaper images and graphic images of Hillary Clinton uh, that portrayed her in this kind of light. Why, why, did, why was that something you started to do? I, you know, it's interesting, I, I, I put a series of slides up on Instagram a couple of years ago, um, or maybe, maybe even been recently, um, depicting uh, women in, in American culture, um, even just in cartoons, as these villainous characters who drag, you know, to club men and, and put their you know, feet on, feet on their faces and who are screaming so much that men's hair are like, you know, is flying off their head and sobbing and men are like drowning in their tears. Like all of these sort of um, very sexist images, um, which are, are not reserved for Hillary Clinton. They're reserved for most women. Um, and then also for black women, it is double that because they're facing sexism and also racism in the caricatures that are created for them in, in political cartoons and things like that. So it sort of became, started to become obsessed with, with her mythology, in particular with Hillary Clinton's um, mythology, not just, not just seeing her as somebody wholly capable and would probably make a very great president while still being very flawed, as literally every single politician in history has been, um, but, but also just seeing this, the mythology of her as, um, as monstrous, as almost, you know, like an, I said, like almost anthropomorphic level mythologizing of her as uh, being a creature in a certain way. Um, I would pick up all these memorabilia pieces across the country from gas stations and Walmarts and things like that. And um, I think I collected like um, dolls of her with blades in between her thighs. She was uh, like a, a Hillary Clinton nutcracker doll. And, all, all different kinds of very strange objects um, during that particular year in 2008, in 2008 during that, um, that run. And was it during this campaign, did, did you become more interested when the campaign ended in continuing to be involved politically, or was it uh, that, that was enough in 2008? I th it, was very, yeah. it was very upsetting and difficult. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think when, when we forget these things, but... It was a very contentious election, and I remember when Barack Obama said to her on stage, "Don't worry, Hillary, you're like likable enough." And that is a that is a phrase that that women have been told forever. Um, this idea that our likability, uh, our, our ability to be in positions of power, depends on our likability being uh, something that that men can put a stamp on. Um, and in that moment, that, you know, that really resonated with me. And I think it was the beginning of, of sort of seeing my own personal awakening in seeing how I had always felt um, shut out of my own ability to have my own kind of power. And so I was seeing myself in her rejection, if that makes sense, which really came to quite a head in the 2016 election. I make the argument in the book, and I think it's true, that the women's march and the subsequent anger that we felt as a as a as a community um, that came after that election was was part smaller part because Donald Trump was elected, but mostly because 
women really saw on a large scale for the first time the rejection, again, of a, of a, of a capable woman in the face of an unqualified man. And that is something that every woman has felt in their, retro, uh, in their respective industries, in their respective jobs, no matter what, it's be, what it is. It doesn't have to be the entertainment business for you to have experienced that. And so I think women were really, for the first time, or not for the first time, but in that moment, they were seeing, they were seeing themselves in her rejection. And you have this scene, just to move back a little bit, so 2016 comes up and you're describing uh, your hesitancy to get involved and uh, kind of, I, you say, I couldn't take the rejection of, of Mrs. Clinton again. And you're having a conversation uh, with your husband, uh, David, David Cross, uh, the comedian. Um, and you said, like many well-meaning guys I know, uh, he would say, don't worry, honey, when Marlo, your daughter, grows up, she can be anything she puts her mind to, to which I would say, that's just it though, she can't. It's literally been proven uh, that women can't. Um, yeah. What was that conversation, kind of how, how did that fit in where you were when that campaign started? Well, I think for us as a country and as a, an intelligent, uh, group of people who are trying to manifest change and trying to make things better in the world. We have to be very careful of the way in which we um, normalize each other's experiences. And definitely, I think we have to be more honest about, in which we've started to become, we need to be more honest about the ways in which we, each of us have been marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to be we need to see that not only in ourselves, but in other people. And, uh, and in that moment, you know, for me, that was really about saying, we can't just use, we can't just say these things that women can do this um, because the truth is that they can't. We've been shown that, that putting our minds to something is not the problem. It is a world around us that doesn't care about the mind that is being put to task. That is, that is the, you know, the way in which women are fighting and trying to create ownership and, and, uh, and forge their own way um, in, our, in our country. So that for me, really, the conversations are not so much about like lying to our kids or telling them a false truth, but in examining what work is still left to be done. And, and so to say that someone is just putting their, if you just put your mind to something, it can happen, is not true. It's not true for women. It's certainly not true still for women of color, um, you know, for, for trans people. I mean, there's just, we can't just um, talk in these sort of big, broad strokes of like a Hallmark holiday greeting card type way, even though we want, we want to impart to our kids the wisdom and the idea that yes, you can, if you work hard, um, you know, you can achieve something. But I, I think it's just also important to prepare them for the world that we live in while we are still living in a, um, a, a sexist society in a lot of ways. And then you have a, a quote um, about Bernie Sanders, and um, everyone remembers the heat from the, the primary in 2016, and you wrote the deeply misogynist tone that spurred the 2016 election did not begin with Donald Trump, it began with Bernie Sanders and the paramount importance his supporters put on making sure his man succeeded at all costs. What do you mean by that? So, you know, I, I think it's important, you as a historian will probably agree, but that we are very truthful about the ways in which these things unfolded, um, the ways in which elections unfold. And I think especially when you are, when you are talking about um, a woman at the center of that, we have to be mindful of remembering the truth about, um, about the experiences that women face when they are trying to achieve positions of power for themselves. In that case, that's not just me reading some BuzzFeed articles or you know, me having some uh, trolls on Twitter or Instagram who are saying, you know, feel the burn 2020, what, or um, uh, 2016, whatever it was. There, that was part of it, which we know a lot of was um, Russian bots and, uh, and things like that. But, um, but these, are, these were experiences that I had 
out in the world, out in the country, as I was stumping for her and as I was actively participating in her campaign. And a lot of it sort of stemmed from this hatred, this idea that how dare she, how dare a woman fail once and then try again and have the tenacity and the audacity to do that. Um, that's kind of the energy that I felt from it. And I think it's important to remember that even those of us who are in liberal communities um, will often sometimes also participate in very harmful, painful rhetoric uh, and, and can are capable of being sexist and, and, and misogynistic. I think it's important to remember that even in those moments, people who are on the left who care so much about you know, policies that protect women and saying that, that this is so important that Bernie Sanders was going to bring policies um, into the White House that would protect women and protect um, you know, our health and our reproductive rights, while also not seeing that what might be equally as important to women as far as a symbol of power and is seeing the living embodiment of ourselves in that position of power. So meaning that we need to honor that seeing women in positions of power can also be as important as policy, that, that actually seeing yourself there does wonders for us. Um, you know, there's this, the old saying, uh, you can't be it if you can't see it. And, and to me, that was what was so powerful about that, and yet it was really something that was sort of sidelined, and, and, and in many arguments that I would have with people about that, that it somehow should be discounted, this idea of seeing a woman as president. Um, and people, you'll even hear them always saying, like, I'm not voting for her just because she's a woman. And, and I just, I, I argue that I think it's important that we count gender. I think it's important that we count um, the differences, our differences, because that's what makes us powerful and that's what we have to bring to the table and what we have to, to give the world. And you're right, I was just looking, you wrote about arguments that you and, and David, who supported Sanders, would get into. Um, and you said, my husband and I would get into such heated arguments about Hillary, deeply personal ones, that at their core weren't even about the secretary, but something far more alarm alarming. We were really talking about two very different things. He was talking about Hillary Clinton, the candidate, and I was talking about the Hillary Clinton that was me. So that yeah. gets a little bit to what you're trying to... So, And I share yeah. these stories because I, the conversations that I've had with David or with friends who are, who are men predominantly, um, because I want people to feel less alone in their conversations, because these are difficult, you know, waters to navigate. They're trying, they're hard, they're exhausting, and I want people to know that I'm having them, that everyone is having them right now. They're really, they're really hard to talk about, and, you know, the irony in that situation is that David is also, um, David is, you know, a a, a Jew from the South. So he was seeing himself in Bernie Sanders in that way as a Jewish man. Um, so for him not to be able to see why that mattered to me and why that's so hard for some men to see on a certain level is interesting and, and worth um, paying attention to. Um, this idea of I identity politics is often used as like a slur and something that is um, that is reserved for communities, whether it's communities of color or um, women or the LGBTQ community. It's used as a way to sort of talk down to the what's important to those communities. But the truth is, we were talking about this earlier, that, that everything is identity politics for everybody. You know, that's how people feel when they're talking about, um, you know, when they're, they're pro-life or they're pro-gun. Like, that is their identity. That is what they believe. That is what makes them who they are, is their belief in something. And so we we have to remember that each of us has has an identity and a politic that is attached, a, 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 a politics of the body and of the mind that is attached to that. And so when we were having those conversations, and we still have them to a, to a degree, but, um, but during that time in particular, it was very contentious and I think difficult. And women were really, when they were talking about Hillary Clinton, those that supported her, they were talking about themselves on a certain level. And so then to not be seen, to not understand what value she brought to the table was a way of saying, you don't value and see what I bring to the table. Um, that's sort of the larger context, I think, of how, how women felt so frustrated by those conversations when they were happen happening. And then um, another key moment in the book comes after the, the famous Donald Trump Access Hollywood tape is aired. Um, 
Do you remember where you were when you heard the audio clip? You start mm -hmm. the chapter, and then you posted something on Instagram soon after that uh, got a lot of attention as well. And uh, what, what was that? What happened? Um, so I posted a story about um, a pretty abusive relationship that I was in in my late teens, early 20s. Um, and I, I told a story about being dragged out of a club in Los Angeles um, by a boyfriend who picked me up by the genitalia and pulled me out. Um, um, and I shared it because I remembered at that time Trump was, Donald Trump was also saying, you know, this is locker room talk. This is how guys talk. And um, words are just words, you know, that's all they are. And, uh, and that this was like an excuse or an argument that was being used across the board um, to defend him and to defend the behavior. And I just wanted to remind everybody that it's not just words and that words are very deeply tied to actions when it comes to um, uh, bodily autonomy and women's safety, physical safety. Um, you know, we are also, we are a, a gender and a species of people who have literal laws preventing um, our ability to make decisions about our own bodies. So there is a lot tied to words and actions when it comes to, to our physical selves. And I think at that time, that was a, that was a, that was when I was really starting to come into my own era of ignition, um, when I was really coming into this, this period of time in which I didn't want to filter how I felt anymore. I didn't want to be quiet about it, I didn't want to hang on to it, um, that I needed to express the ways in which I was angry, the ways in which I was frustrated, the ways in which I had felt silenced. And this is where it sort of started for me. And then election night 2016, where were you? <laughs> I was, we all can remember it. I was at the Javits Center, mm -hmm. um, sitting in the Clinton um, room with all of the surrogates and the family and everything. It was a very upsetting night. It was also upsetting because I was seven months pregnant with a girl inside of me. And I couldn't drink alcohol. That was <laughs> so all my friends were like crying and drunk, and I was like, "Someone pass the mailbox. This is fun." And, fun. And then you went. You went to the women's march. Yes, I went so to the, the first women's march after the. <coughs> yeah, that's before right. Before the inauguration, after I can't remember now. So the yeah, the very first one, yeah. and my doctor was like, "You may not go to D.C. under any circumstances," because it was a month before my delivery at that time, and I made, made the phone call to ask her if I could go from the train already bound to DC. I had technically like just totally lied to her, but, um, but I did feel like if I was gonna be in a sea of you know doulas and doctors, so if my water broke, I was probably gonna be in really great hands. And so what um, happened? So I went there and um, I went to a breakfast that morning with Cecile Richards, who I know a lot of you got to see here um, recently. She was here at Princeton speaking. And, um, and, and afterwards, she was like, you're way too pregnant to go like walk into this crowd. So get in my van, and we'll all go drive there to the march together. And it was really a powerful, really, really powerful day. Um, I've never experienced anything like it. And, and I would think I was so charged by the experience of that march, um, of, of being alongside all of those women and men, by the way, um, the fathers, the sons, the grandfathers that showed up that day, um, that when I actually went back to New York that night, I came out of the subway station from the train, and I walked, came, happened to come right up into the New York march that was happening, the Women's March in New York, and so I just kept marching. It was like swollen and waddling down Fifth Avenue. Um, I, think I, I maybe got about eight blocks, and I was like, okay, that's, that's quite enough. Um, but it was a really, it was a really intense time, you know, where um, you kind of started to feel this swell of change that was happening. There's a famous, I'm writing a book about a rabbi named Abraham Heschel, and he marches in Selma, and he says when he, got, he, he gets back that uh, he felt like his legs were praying. That was the kind of emotion that he got uh, from being part of that. Yeah. So then you write an uh, um, an article, an op-ed in the New York Times mm -hmm. that really it, it got a, a lot of attention and kind of continued to move you deeper into this world of activism. How did that come about? So the, the short version of that story is just that um, uh, I stated publicly, um, I told, 
told a very brief story about the time that uh, an actor by the name of James Woods uh, picked up on me when I was a teenager. Um, I was at Mel's Diner in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. Um, uh, and, you know, he vehemently denied it and then also called me a liar. Um, so he went, came out in this huge article in The Hollywood Reporter saying that I had lied. Um, and I think that the normal reaction, the reaction that would have taken place before all of this, um, would have been the reaction to say something, um, you know, to speak to my anger at being called a liar and write him off and close the book and call it a day. Um, both one, because it's a scary thing to put yourself out there and, and speak about something like this, um, uh, and, and two, that there was a livelihood at stake. We're in a business that is known for blacklisting people and for certainly um, not hiring and shutting out people who, who disturb the status quo. Um, and in this particular moment, this was three months before Jody Cantor and Megan Toey published their um, expose in the New York Times about Harvey Weinstein. This was pre that. Um, but my reaction to it was to write this op-ed for the New York Times. I also wrote another op-ed for Teen Vogue and a series of things that just sort of came out because it, it ultimately wasn't even about James Woods. <laughs> you know, it, this idea, the name of the article, the name of the op-ed was I'm done with not being believed. And really the, the, the true feeling I was trying to express was not just about him, but about all the other James Woodses in the world and experiences of that that I have had, of being made to feel completely invisible and being told that my truth is not a truth worth valuing, um, worth being seen. And so in that moment, it felt, it felt less like, it didn't feel like retaliation or it didn't feel like I was trying to get attention or anything in that in that realm, or even that I was stoking a fire, it just, I, it felt uncontrollable. It felt like, you know, I describe in the book this idea of like pulling a pin on something and letting yourself detonate and see what comes of that. It's a mess, it's terrifying, it's destructive, but, but change and putting yourself out there in those uncomfortable ways is so necessary in order for us to shed light and in order for there to ultimately be a dam that breaks open until you're getting more and more people talking publicly, which is literally what happened. So me writing that op-ed, me sharing those stories, me being publicly frustrated was, I didn't start a movement, I wasn't even really a part of anything. This was something that everybody was kind of collectively doing. It was in the zeitgeist in that moment. Women were, it was not just me that was, you know, done with not being believed. Women were done with not being believed. Women were really done with being the Hillary Clinton in their own life. Whether or not you liked her, supported her, it doesn't matter. What we can all agree on, what we have to agree on, is that pervasive sexism and misogyny played a huge part in both of those elections. It is still playing a part. We look at the racism and sexism with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, who, who, has, who has people, her colleagues, commenting on her clothing, essentially saying she came from the Bronx. She must be too poor to afford to wear something like that. We are seeing it constantly, um, and it's still happening. So it's not just exclusive to her. It is for women everywhere of all kinds. And did you talk, you talked to Jody Cantor in the middle of this? Yeah. She, she interviewed you. <coughs> so I, yeah, Jody read the piece that I wrote in the Times and she reached out to me via a third party, a friend. Um, and so I write about how I spoke to her in the book and I connected her with some of the people um, who ended up in the story and also other people who were, um, who told their story and then, but then wouldn't let her publish it, which is a normal thing for investigative journalists because they were too afraid. You know, I had a friend that had an experience with Harvey Weinstein in an elevator who Jody talked to, and, um, and then ultimately she decided not to have her story, you know, she didn't want her name added to it, because, you know, at that point, I think I quote her loosely in the book, not by name, but by saying, like, what's the point? Like, nothing's going to happen to him, and then, and then it's going to be on my back, and it's going to be on the other women's backs, and he's going to retaliate, and, uh, you know, what, what does that give us? And that's a, that's a real fear. That's a real, when you have someone that powerful with that much control who abuses it, it's very possible. Nobody knew how that was going to unfold. Nobody knew that he was actually going to be, you know, 
removed from the board of his own company and, and, and have himself stripped of that power in that moment. We didn't know. But again, speaking to the zeitgeist, you had Jody, you know, writing this story. <coughs> Two days later, I go to Los Angeles and uh, I'm sitting at a restaurant bar and this guy comes up and taps me on the shoulder and I turn around and it's Ronan Farrow. And Ronan Farrow says he read the piece in the New York Times and he would love to talk to me about this story he's working on. It's like they were working on these stories simultaneously. It was the zeitgeist. There was something that was happening, this power, this, this palpable change we're talking about, that was happening all at once. And it's still happening. We're still feeling it. And what, I mean, how did those conversations unfold? So initially, um, the story breaks on Weinstein and then there's fear probably to say anything because the assumption is he'll stay in power. Yeah. But then as the stories start to accumulate and things are happening, what kinds of private conversations are you having with friends, with family? How's it, cha sorry, how's it changing? Well, um, it was interesting because the subsequent few first days after that article came out, I think with, even within the first like 12 hours of it, it was like, you know, I described pretty, uh, in pretty great detail what the women in the actress community were feeling, which is just like deer in the headlights. And no one knew who was going to talk first, you know. Nobody knew who was going to speak out and share the next story. And before you knew it, it really was like a dam breaking open. Um, and you suddenly have another actress saying, well, this happened to me, this story about him chasing me around a hotel room in a, you know, bathrobe. Like, and it starts coming out more and more and more. And it was right around this time, you know, when it was, because it was such a big public deal that um, Alyssa Milano tweeted this thing about, um, you know, if you've ever been sexually assaulted or, or sexually harassed at work, um, say me too with me, which is not something that Alyssa Milano started. She didn't know at that time when she had done it, but it was actually founded by activist Toronto Burke over two decades ago. So I always refer to it in the book as 2017's Me Too movement because it wasn't really founded by her, even though some people might think that that's um, the case. And so then you all of a sudden it was like a little crack in the dam and then it became a flood and it was just massive. And you've got millions and millions of women, you know, it was, it was a very painful time too, if, we, if you remember, because suddenly you know, mothers are seeing their daughters tweet it or, or daughters are seeing their mothers write it um, and realizing how much it affects all of us. Men are writing it, are saying me too. It's, you know, you're realizing how much the abuse of power is such a pervasive problem in any industry. Um, and, and, and that was really like a very powerful moment in which we all suddenly saw this huge problem. It was like, the Band-Aid had been ripped off, and it's like, well, here's the infection now that has been here festering because we didn't do anything about it. We just put a Band-Aid over it. And now we have to deal with the infection, and it's going to suck. It's going to suck. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun for anybody. But, I mean, what revolution is? And then Time's Up uh, starts. Uh, it's an organization you help create or entity or movement, whatever, I don't know what label you use for it, but what organization, organization what, what was the impetus, who did you work with, how did you uh, translate all these ideas circulating uh, in you into this operation? So it, it, it happened very much um, in the way I think that organically civil rights movements happen where you get a bunch of people who are in positions of power in a room together, and in this case you had, we had actresses, we had um, executives, we had very high level women from the entertainment business across job titles, um, meeting and sitting down with activists who had equally as powerful names. You have um, Monica Ramirez, um, who works for the um, uh, uh, Domestic Farm Workers Union, and I Jen Poo, and um, uh, Fatima Goss Graves, who runs the National Women's Law Center. You have all these powerful women getting in rooms together and saying, we're done with not being believed, right? Like this, the ultimate motto. And we're, not gonna, we're now not sitting down at the table to have a conversation about this anymore. We're not asking for permission. It was the ceasing of asking for permission in that moment and saying, we are now taking control of the situation and we want to cr create change. 
in that, I, I write a lot about it in the book, but in this particular case, I really go through and show how the meetings that were happening and popping up around LA and New York in specific, <coughs> what came out of that was, it was actually came from America Ferreira, who brought up to us in a meeting um, the letter that uh, 700,000 women from the Farm Workers Union wrote a letter to the women of Hollywood saying, we stand in solidarity with you. And this was after the Harvey Weinstein story came out. We stand in solidarity with you. We have also faced in the fields, in the agricultural business, horrific um, abuses of power and, and, and sexual assault and discrimination and harassment. And we are silent voices because some of us also are immigrants. We don't have the same rights as you do, but we stand with you. And they published it in, um, uh, in a paper, and America brought the paper in, I remember, and she read it to us. And that was really, the, the seed of Time's Up came from knowing that we needed to respond to these women. But that the response could not just be an idea. It had to be tied to an action. And so the action was the 20 plus million dollars that we very quietly raised uh, to create the um, Legal Defense Fund, Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which uh, is money that is allocated and used um, to help people fight either in, uh, you know, in court or um, from public perception, uh, uh, sexual discrimination in the workplace in specific. Um, and so that's sort of really how it was born, was sitting down and talking about uh, we wanted to create an organization and a movement that was founded in this principle, in this idea of saying enough's enough, and not saying we're willing to negotiate and work for the safety of others, that this is just, this is the line, and you cross over it, and there's going to be a consequence. And that's the way things are going to go moving forward. And, and as you became more involved, you write how you became more cognizant of the different kinds of issues that uh, differ because of class, because of race, how the multivaried nature of feminism, when you start to unpack the different experiences. Yeah, something well, really powerful yeah. happens when you are in a room with women devoid of the male perspective, of the, of the, of the male voice. This is not to say that the male voice does not matter and should not matter and is not part of the conversation. I'm just saying in this moment, when you had white women, black women, Muslim women, um, women with disabilities, trans women, when we were all sitting down in a room together, suddenly it becomes very obvious that our versions of feminism don't necessarily align and, and in the scramble to have each of us some form of power, we have we have pushed away our sisters and not really been the powerful voices for each other that we could have been. So in that case in particular, you know, suddenly white women are having to have these conversations with black women that they've not had to respond to before. And now here we were say, looking and going, even the most liberal, woke um, activist of us who are, who are white women and who, who fancy ourselves feminists, um, have maybe not been there in the best ways that we can for our sisters of color. So there was a, a lot of that conversation that was happening in that room at that time and, and suddenly starting to see that, that the balance was also not just, between, um, not just between men and women necessarily, but also between uh, different races and socioeconomical backgrounds of women. And, and again, it always comes back to power and the abuse of some kind of power. And even those of us who are, again, feminist, um, you, we are capable of that. And it's in the examination of our own behavior and our own shortcomings to a certain degree that we should be able to change those things. And that was happening because women were by themselves. We had to face it, literally and metaphorically. And you, you, you have two books, really, to come out of this moment for you. The first was Any Man which was fictional, uh -huh. but dealt with these issues. And, and this book, which is more nonfiction, autobiography, political narrative, it's a mix of things. What has been the reaction uh, as you've spoken about this around the country? And what's some of the feedback you've received? It has been a very strange mixed bag. <laughs> um, I, I, the, the, the events have been illuminating and um, really wonderful and profound. and you know, people asking very difficult, painful questions in audiences just like this, where 
it's sometimes hard to stand up and, and ask something because we're either scared we're going to look dumb or we're going to be asking the wrong thing or because it's hard to share a story so publicly. Um, and then I also just found the, the influx of this anger um, would often show up in very strange ways. I had one guy uh, stand up in an audience when the, during the Q&A and ask me if I'd ever been raped. That was interesting. Um, but you have, you have some behaviors like that of, of, of wanting to be sort of almost antagonistic and not wanting to align with, with the message of the book, which is ultimately about total inclusion. You know, while it does talk about um, a patriarchal world and how difficult it has, it has been with the imbalance of, you know, men predominantly running things and women predominantly being left out of the picture, women and minority voices and communities, um, you know, this is not something that doesn't also happen to men. Um, Any Man, the novel that I wrote, really looks at, um, uh, looks at sexual assault as it pertains to men, of which one in 10 men in the United States report being sexually assaulted, so that's a real thing. When we are thinking about who it affects and who it harms, I think there's, we barely scratched the surface as far as that's um, concerned. But there's also like, in the book, there's a male manifesto that I wrote in the, uh, towards, I think, the middle last half of the book yeah. that is very specifically for, um, for men who want to be a part of this movement, who want to be a part of it in a proactive, supportive way, but don't know how. Maybe you don't know, you don't know what the right thing is to do. And, and sort of looking at how we can all participate because we do need each other. We can't, women can't, you know, we, we won't get the equality that we are seeking to, to have without the, the support and inclusion of men and their voices and their ability to share that power and to say that this is a problem, this has been a problem. We want to help correct the problem. And so to me, um, I think the lesson you can take away from the book that I hope it offers is that it feels, it does shed light on some of the, the very difficult, painful experiences we've all had in this country in the last couple of years, but it, more than anything, I think it's a proactive look at how each of us can harness, harness our own feelings of anger or resentment or othering, whatever that may be, and put it out in the world and put it out in the world in a way that helps forge the change, as opposed to staying stuck in where we are in our defenses and and unable to 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 go with the way the country is going. On that, how did you feel when you watched the Kavanaugh hearings? I was pretty, I mean, it was deeply upsetting, but it was also, I mean, it was, it was just a reminder that history repeats itself in so many ways, and, and also a reminder that even, even you know, post, um, post 2017's Me Too movement, all of these things I've just shared with you and told you about, that there's still, um, you know, a woman can get up and tell her story, and, uh, and the privilege of a man who is able to behave that way um, will still be elected to the highest court in the land in the face of that story being told. And so just a reminder of when we talk about uh, of punishment doesn't fit the crime or, or what are the, con the new consequences for sexual harassment and assault, it's like we don't even know yet because we're still applying the old consequences, which are no consequences, apparently. So to me, when I look at that, I, you know, it made me feel like there's still a long way to go. There's still a long way to go. We were repeating the story of Anita Hill with that. It was terrifying and upsetting to watch and to know that in the face of women begging and screaming and saying, this is every experience I've ever had with someone who was in a position of power who did this to me and they still, you know, they still became the fill in the blank um, in that position of power and how could you let this happen? And it still just happened anyway, even in the face of everything we've been through in the last few years. And then you end the book, not to give away the ending, but you, you end it with a letter to your daughter, Marlo. Mm -hmm. um, what's the letter about and, and why'd you decide to end it that way? I decided to end it there and to write to her because I wanted to tell her the truth, not a veiled version of the truth. If she reads it someday, if our kids look back at this time, um, I wanted to be as honest as possible about my own shortcomings within that, um, 
my own conversations that have been painful and difficult and, and my own ability to grow from those things. And I wanted to remind her, you know, um, that she maybe not necessarily can be anything that she wants to be if she puts her mind to it. I would hope that would be true. But to just remind her, you know, in the face of all of the amazing things that are going to happen in her life, it's also going to be very tough because as of right now, she's a girl. I don't know what she's going to be someday, what she chooses to be. Whatever she'll be, to me, she'll be perfect. But for her to know that this is the world that we live in. And so I want to set her up with those real expectations so that it's not a fairy tale. Because I feel for so many women, our, our experience, our attempt at being in these positions of power, at being seen um, on any level as capable and possible um, is a fairy tale that we have been given. And I don't want fairy tales anymore. I want our real stories to shine through. We're going to have time for questions and answers in a second, but let me just read a few lines from the end of the letter, and maybe you can uh, just uh, we can end on that. You you say if I if I have the if I can read uh, from your work, um, the world can. When be... a man explain to me my own work. No. <laughs> uh, typical. Typical. The world can be tough. This world can be unkind and confused and filled with people who mean to do harm and even who don't, but still do it anyway. The world may leave you feeling as lost as a locket in the ocean, as raw as a skinned heart, as withheld from yourself as I ever did. And then you write, to find yourself in it, pull the pin on your instincts and detonate. Watch what collapses, what bursts, and what is forced to break out. Um, what are the instincts that you're talking about at the end? And you begin the book with that as well. Honestly, I'm still finding them. I mean, I think it's a work in progress, but for the most part, I think putting yourself out there and, like I said, having, letting yourself be immersed in the discomfort of this time. Don't shy away from it. Don't be afraid. Don't be defensive of it. Um, have the hard conversations with people who you have you know, done wrong to or who have done wrong to you. Um, don't just call people out, call them in. Uh, that is a term that a lot of black feminists use. I think it's brilliant and beautiful and speaks to exactly the moment that we're in. This idea of, um, of changing one another foundationally and fundamentally by having these greater, more complex conversations by listening to our gut when we know something is wrong and speaking out against it, no matter the consequences of that speaking out. Because if we do those things collectively, that's how things change. They can stop one of us, but they can't stop all of us. Um, so the instinct there is really about listening to your own self and learning how to, um, to be more in tune with what you think should be right about the world, not just necessarily what you think should, is, is wrong about it, and then putting forth an action um, that is applied to that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amber Tamlin. Um, thank, you. thank you for a wonderful, wonderful evening. Uh, Amber will be right out here. You can get a copy of the book and meet her. Uh, and thanks for coming. Thank you, Julian.